Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening to attend the second and final event of our book launch um, for our newly released edited collection, Advanced Directives Across Asia, a Comparative Sociolegal Analysis. As those of you who were um, here with us last night will know, we considered advanced directives in Hong Kong and Singapore, focusing on practical challenges for Hong Kong um, medical or healthcare practitioners. Whereas tonight's event will showcase um, several other jurisdictions from the book and also consider some of the trends, patterns, and observations across the Asian jurisdictions. So by way of a little background, um, an advanced directive, also known as a living will, is defined in our book as a statement in which a person with capacity makes an advanced decision in matters concerning their health and welfare, which is to be implemented in the event that the person loses capacity in the future. So in this book, we've categorized our 16 jurisdictions into three categories. The first, uh, well-regulated jurisdictions, refers to jurisdictions with a clear set of legal rules, which is either legislative or judicial, uh, on or encompassing ADs. And so these are the ones with a clear legal regime in place and include Israel, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, and India. The semi-regulated jurisdictions are those with other forms of regulation on AD, such as official regulatory documents, practical guidelines, or um, other forms of guidance from professional societies. And these include Hong Kong, Iran, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Turkey. So finally, we have the non-regulated jurisdictions, uh, where there might be at best broad principles that, um, are, that are contained in legislation or guidelines uh, around healthcare that stress the importance of patient preferences. Uh, in general terms, but no regulations or guidelines specifically on ADs. And these include China, Japan, Macau, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia. So from our book launch events, we're, uh, for our book launch events, sorry, we're very excited to have with us in person representatives from Singapore, Thailand, uh, and India from the well-regulated jurisdictions, Hong Kong and Malaysia from the semi-regulated jurisdictions, and Macau from the non-regulated jurisdictions. So tonight, we're gonna to begin with a presentation by Associate Professor Tracy Chan on the Singapore regime, followed by a presentation by Dr. Tina Teng Am Noi on the uh, Thai regime. Uh, Ms. Kelly Drew and Dr. Sharon Kaur will then present on the Indian and Malaysian regimes, respectively. And last but not least, we'll have a presentation from Dr. Menteng Yong on uh, the Macau regime. So we'll then move on to a roundtable discussion led by Dr. Michael Downer and myself as editors, uh, co-editors of this book, and we'll be joined by our representative from Hong Kong, Associate Professor Rebecca Lee as well. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into detail about our contributors' lengthy accomplishments, uh, which are detailed in the biographies in the program booklet. Um, and we are looking forward to a very lively discussion today, and we'll ho we hope that you'll join us with any questions or comments uh, during the roundtable discussion. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tracy for the first presentation. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's really thank nice you. to meet my collaborators in person, as many for the first time. Um, this evening, because I have 10 minutes, a grand total of 10 minutes, um, and I have already spoken earlier in detail about the technicalities of the Singapore regime. So what, what I thought I'd do is actually to look ahead uh, to what has happened since uh, we first enacted uh, advanced directive legislation in Singapore. So let me start by uh, basically saying that the Advanced Medical Directive Act uh, was uh, an early experiment in Singapore, attempting to try and encourage or enable uh, the use of advanced directives uh, to help patients make decisions or at least guide their care, um, particularly at the end of life. Um, yesterday, I went through a lot of detail. My chapter, which is open access, uh, will go through all the technical details about how that regime was intended to work. But here's the point. Uh, the impact that it has made is actually quite minimal. Um, there's been very low take up of uh, advanced medical directives under the Act. Um, we're talking about 10 of these implemented over the course of almost 20 years, right? Just 10 actually implemented. Of course, 24 plus thousand us and 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 my, my chapter will explain why it has been so difficult to get people to sign them well maybe most people don't see a need for it but more importantly it is quite challenging to actually implement uh, the statutory advanced medical directive 
the second point that uh, I, I think many see is that the idea of the advanced medical directive and the way it's designed under the Act in Singapore is very transactional. It's I'm making a, a bargain with, I mean, a, as a metaphor, I'm making a bargain with my doctor or my healthcare service provider. It's made under conditions of absolute secrecy. I'm exaggerating a bit, but, um, and then you will do what I tell you to do, right? But uh, as is the case in Asia, in general, I'm generalizing, but in Asia, most of the time, this is not the way patients approach healthcare and, and healthcare challenges. Uh, it's it's made in uh, a relational context of family discussing with uh, different doctors and, and patients getting support from their family. But the act just doesn't easily accommodate this kind of decision-making model. And, and third, and, and, and most importantly, and this is what I keep hearing from the doctors whenever they complain to lawyers about the, the regime that has been created for them, is your act is so narrow, it is basically irrelevant for most of the things that we need, need advanced directives for. Because it says you can withdraw extraordinary life-sustaining treatment when the patient is terminally ill and is about to die. But by the time you get there, it's kind of obvious that, yes, there's no point giving you treatment that's just going to prolong your dying if it's very clear you're going to die. So what's the point of having an advanced directive? So the point is, outside of that, it's possible to create your own adapted advanced directive, but uh, the statutory protections are not there. The pathways for accessing, interpreting, and, and applying them uh, are unclear, basically. So, so what I wanted to talk about is actually, so what's the next chapter, right? So we started with the experiment. What is the next chapter? Because you have clear concessions in Parliament by the Minister of then Minister of Health, Mr. Corbyn Wan, uh, that, yeah, the, the Act really doesn't work well. We need to amend it. But this was like 10 years ago. And it is quite clear that government is not, has no appetite to, to revisit this as a matter of legislative reform. So what do we have? We have another statute called the Mental Capacity Act uh, of 2008. What it does for us is we have a general framework for proxy decision making for persons without capacity. Uh, it stipulates who can make decisions on behalf of incapacitated patients, and it stipulates how we go about deciding on their behalf. Okay. Second of all, it gives us another tool uh, in, in, in decision making at the end of life, which is the lasting power of attorney. Uh, I understand it's called durable power or enduring power of attorney in Hong Kong. The idea is the same. Um, for some people, it's much easier to make a decision about who I want to entrust deciding for me than to actually make decisions about what I want or do not want in the future, right? Cognitively, that seems to be more straightforward, at least for some people. And, and that's what the lasting power of attorney, uh, at least in design or intent, is supposed to do. Um, but for technical reasons, uh, it uh, probably too restrictive uh, than, than what it needs to be. But anyway, it's there, right? So you, you have this other alternative. In fact, the US, when they say advanced directive, they do mean an advanced decision together with uh, a durable or lasting power of attorney so that whatever is unclear, I, I, I know to refer to and ask uh, for a proxy decision. So, so these basic elements under the Mental Capacity Act from the legal foundation for our advanced care plan and program, which uh, until last year was called the Living Matters Program in, in, in Singapore. Um, I just noticed that we've taken down the main website, so I don't know what's happened to it since, but uh, this is what it's known uh, as, the Living Matters Program. And this is what advanced care plan is, and I'll say why it is still relevant in the context of advanced directives. So ACP, or advanced care planning, is a voluntary process of discussion about future care between the individual, their care providers, irrespective of discipline and often those close to the individual, uh, should the individual become seriously ill in the future and be unable to make decisions and or communicate their wishes to others. Right. So in this process, that does require quite a bit of training, a bit of understanding about how to guide someone through that process. This discussion may include clarifications on the individual's wishes and concerns about current and future care, 
the important values that they hold dear, uh, that they would like to be uh, observed or respected in making decisions on their behalf, and what their personal goals of care are. And here's the, the, the last, and, and in a sense, the, the more important point about ACP when you compare it to advanced directives, which is the ACP is intended to be an iterative process, continuing you keep revisiting it as circumstances change and as possibly people change or patients change as well. So, so what is the outcome uh, of advanced care planning? Uh, in the main, the, the basic objective is the, the, the reduction into writing of a statement of values, wishes and goals of care for the particular individual. Uh, the secondly, the appointment of an informal healthcare proxy, uh, or more legally speaking, the execution of a lasting power of attorney. Right, the healthcare proxy. Uh, just take it that actually it's quite an innovation because uh, our lasting power of attorney has quite serious constraints on it. But this informal healthcare proxy allows a very simple and formal way for a patient to say, if you need someone definitive to consult about my care when I cannot speak for myself, please talk to X, Y, or Z. Okay, there's no need for witness, there's no need for... It's just an informal statement, please talk to this person. So at least the, the attending physician has an idea of who is the principal person to, to talk to, uh, to, to make decisions together for the incapacitated patient. And finally, and this is where it sort of comes together, if necessary, if the patient considers it necessary or prudent, uh, ACP can lead to the execution of advanced directives, not just the statutory advanced medical directive, but ones that are flexibly crafted for personal objectives of the patient in question. Um, why might a patient want to do this? I think yesterday we heard uh, Shirley or someone suggest, you know, that there might be quite there might be a great potential for family conflict about how to care for a person. So you actually have an AD that says, look, this is what this person definitively decided. That tends to help in some situations. But more for, for me, uh, you know, as I see Singapore society evolve, um, ACP assumes that you have this social network to support you. But increasingly, we're seeing lots of singles or, 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 or childless couples and get old. And, and, and who, who do they fall back on, right? So an advanced directive might be one way in which they make quite clear um, what they can and cannot accept, right? Together with this fuller discussion of what their goals are, what their values are, and hopefully that will be more helpful for their healthcare providers. <clears throat> Lastly, I mean, my, my time is up, but you know, it, it really sounds much better than just focusing on advanced decisions as a singular document that will solve it all, which it really cannot. Uh, but just three quick points. Even with this more flexible, more encompassive, more iterative process, it's still, for reasons that we don't fully understand, it's still quite hard to get people to, to buy into this whole process. Uh, data from the Agency of Integrated Care says, you know, out of 50% of ACP's discussions are initiated, but they, they go nowhere, right? Because of family, what's the word they use of interference, right? The, we don't think this is of value or, or please don't burden my, my parent with this and things like that. Okay, second of all, um, <clears throat> it does assume uh, you know, a, a very supportive network and, and where there will be supportive family members or caregivers who can help implement the, the objectives of ACP. And for, for, for increasing numbers of people in modern society, that may not be the case anymore. So we have to figure out what to do in those situations. And third, uh, it does place a lot of responsibility on the person who administers medical treatment or who, who coordinates it. Um, because of the flexibility, there's going to be a lot of ambiguity or uncertainty or interpretation required about what those values mean in this situation, and we do need to prepare healthcare professionals and the, the, the systems in hospitals and in nursing homes to work out how to, to, to figure out what ACP means for this particular patient. Right. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Tracy. That's great. Um, we're going to move very swiftly on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Tina Tengamwane from 
I get this right, Chualalongkorn University. I apologize for the mispronunciation. Tina, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me today. I can see them very short. Pandu, look at me and part of the podium over here. <laughs> okay, so because of the time limit, I'm, I will just give the overview of my chapter and then I am pick up the, argue, the, the key argument in my chapter. And if you want to look up for more information, you can take a look in our book, um, Advanced Directive Across Asia and Has Open Access. Okay, so um, for the chapter overview, I have uh, in my chapter about the 80s system in Thailand, there are three sections. The first section is about the law and then about uh, the, the culture and the, society, uh, the social values in Thailand. And then the, the challenges that the AD regime in Thailand might face. So there are three main sections in my chapter. Starting from the law, Article 12 of the National Health Act in Thailand provides that I'm a person has a right to make an advanced directive um, setting out their desire to refuse any full-toe health services which simply prolong death or cause any unnecessary suffering. And the condition of the implementation is that that patient is in a terminally ill state or yeah, you can see it's quite long. It's about like being in a persistent vegetative state. And well, the key concept of the AD regime in Thailand can be simply explained that the laws want it to be easy for a person to make an advanced directive. So, so, so comparing to Singapore is quite different. Like we don't require any registration. We don't set out any strict formats of an AD. So it's very flexible to make an AD in any form. And there's no requirement of any involvement of medical professions in the process of making an AD, no requiring any witnesses. The only requirement is that an AD must be in writing and that AD must be made while the, while the maker um, is conscious and has uh, um, mental capacities to fully understand their actions and the consequences of their actions. And then side at the bottom of that, that document or put their fingerprints on that. And that's it. So it's very easy compared to like to Singapore or in Taiwan that like they have some formats or they have some um, requirement for registration. In Thailand, no registration, no strict formats, just in writing. So you can see that I'm, we try to make it simple to encourage people to make an advanced directive, but simplicity and flexibility do not always reduce difficulties in implementing an advanced directive. Well, that comes to the second section of my chapter. It's about the Thai culture, the, so the social values in Thailand, the norms in Thailand. Um, the first thing is, is that um, Thai society embraces the concept of collectivism. I think, I think it's quite common in most Asian countries um, that Family relationship is very important in our life, and an individual's decision can be influenced by other family members. And also, the um, the concept of paternalism is embedded in Thai culture, especially you can see from the traditional convention that um, children should respect and accept the advice of seniors, and that can cause some people tend to defer their decisions to expert whom they believe to have more knowledge or more experience in that field than them. So you can see that um, the norms and the culture in Thailand doesn't, su doesn't support the idea of, of making an advanced directive that much, like it's not much about the self-determination of the patient that much. But one out out outstanding notion in Thailand is Buddhism. I'm, it's very strong. Um, okay, Thailand is not a secular state, but Buddhism is very strong in Thailand and has um, deep root in our culture. And on one way, on, on one way, Buddhist teaching is, um, supports making an advanced direct uh, an, an AD in terms of it supports the, the notion of uncertainty of life and letting go of um, the materiality of life. So preparing for death, deciding your good death it's in, uh, in accordance with um with uh, the concept of buddhism but on an, but in another way i buddhism always also cultivated 
the norm of gratitude towards parents in Thailand. So some um, some patients' children might fear of being condemned by the, the, the public to let their parents die easily, even though that is their advance directive, uh, their, their, their last will, their, yes, their living will, yes. Even though it's their living will, the AD that made, um, some children might feel that they might get condemned for letting go of their parents easily. And it might be contrasted with the norm of gratitude in Thailand. And you can see like medical, and, and, and one thing to be noted is that the medical professionals in Thailand, even though they're like the, the law, exempt the liabilities of the medical professionals for, for complying with an AD, but the, the medical professionals do not have any legal standings to petition for the judicial enforcement of an AD. So if the, you know, like, because the implementation of an AD is when the, the patient is in the terminally ill state. So at that, at that point, if the family members don't want to follow that AD, the doctor, the medical professions, professionals have no right, no like no standing to enforce that, to, uh, to fight for the enforcement of that AD. So considering the, the, the culture of Thailand and the, the fact that it's very simple and very flexible for making an AD, there are three challenges, three difficulties in the implementation of an AD in Thailand. The first one is about the uncertainty about the validity of an AD. You can see that there's no registration. So, and there is no requirement for the involvement of any medical professions to check the, to check the mental state, the mental capacities of the AD makers, why that person made it. In, in practice, it's just one sentence put in, in, in AD saying that I am writing this AD while I'm conscious and why I, I have full understanding of my actions and the consequences of my action. That's it. And then sign a paper it says no um, proof, no official proof for that me mental statement, um, their mental state at that time. So the doctor might feel a little uncertain about the validity of an AD and, you know, like compare, comparing with a living at uh, the last will, you know, the last will for uh, inheritance, like we can challenge the validity of the last will, but for an AD is quite, it, um, an AD is shaped by the limited of time, like the doctor has to decide at that time. So um, the doctors might feel hesitant to follow that AD because if other family members say that um, the AD maker made this AD why he was like desperate, doesn't have quite constant uh, conscious at that time. So no one knows because just, just, um, just a statement in a paper with no, um, no scientific proof that they have the full capacities of making an AD to make it, uh, to make an AD valid. So that is first quite, um, the first difficulty is in implementation. And the second one is about the unawareness of the existence of an AD. Again, without any registration system, the doctor might not realize um, the existence of any AD. So if you look into our, um, our, our book and you can see that in other jurisdictions, like in, in Singapore, that there's the registration system or in Taiwan that, that link um, the information, the data with, uh, with the electronic information of that, that person. So, when, so they can know it immediately when that pa patient got admitted. But in Thailand, no registration. So that depends whether the patient show the AD to the doctor first. So you can see it's very easy to make. It's very simple. It's kind of flexible to, 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 to make an AD in Thailand. But um, there are many difficulties that the doctor will face, especially the hesitance, he hesitancy to, about the existence of an AD. And then it's a very important problem, difficulties of impl in implementation. It's about the conflicts with the patients. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the medical professionals are exempted from the legal liabilities of complying with an AD, but they have no legal standing. And, and there are also no penalties for non-compliance. So you can see like comparing for comparing between um, an AD maker 
who is now like um, losing their conscience and cannot speak up for himself anymore. And the family members who might feel another thing, the doctor might feel hesitant because the um the family members might find some like may find some lawsuit against against that that doctor for following the AD and the AD makers cannot like cannot stand up to speak that ah okay I I, I um sorry for what the doctor said so the doctor will feel, feel hesitant to like to oppose the family members and there are no penalties for non-compliance so it's better, like, it's better to, to have no conflicts with the family members. And you can see that even though there is exemption of liabilities, um, the law that does not shield the doctors from any threats of legal actions. So they don't, they don't want to undergo the exciting judicial process. So normally, that, that they are in practice, there can be problems when there are conflicts with a family member and the doctor felt hesitant to follow the AD if it is contrast with the other family members. And that's that that's some difficulties that might have been pop up when it's um when it's too simple, when it's too flexible in making an AD. So it's not real encouragement for an AD, but it might be discouragement. So the time is up now. So thank you and we might have more discussion about this issue later. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Very interesting indeed. So we're going to move swiftly on to Miss Kelly Drew, who's with the Indian chapter, uh, currently at the University of Hamburg in Germany. Kelly, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, what a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much. Um, right. So um, I just, since we have ten minutes and there's a lot to be said, I just run through some of the ideas in our chapter, but. Primarily, it must be noted that since the writing of the chapter and publication of the book, um, India has changed its regime, so to say, um, in terms of the regulation of advanced directors. So I'll get to that. Uh, but yes, I'll try to cover as much as possible. But um, yes, I think uh, the guidelines have remained more or less the same, um, except there are some changes. So yeah, OK. Um, right, it must be noted that uh, the discussion on advanced directors in India has been very closely related to euthanasia. There was a very famous case of Aruna Shanbag, a nurse. Um, and that was raped and uh, was in persistent vegetative state for for um, nearly 40 years. So um, the notion around advanced directors has been very closely conflated with, with discussions around euthanasia, but one finds the traces of um, the legality of advanced directors in the already uh, the 196 and the 241st um, law commission reports where skepticism was uh, portrayed um, around the misuse by family members. Um, and in fact, the draft bill that was recommended by the Law Commission considered advanced directors to be invalid. But a breakthrough came in uh, as recently as March 2018, uh, where in the Common Cause decision, the Supreme Court of India declared end of life advanced directors to be legally valid. And not only that, they came up with a list of guidelines. Um, interestingly enough, um, there was always a parallel development that took place uh, through the Mental Health Care Act. And it was passed in 2017 with not as much hue and cry as compared to the Aruna Shanba case in euthanasia and so on, but it actually legalized psychiatric advanced directives. So that only happened in that, in fact, um, played a role in legalizing the end of life advanced uh, directives in the common cause decision. Um, interestingly enough, in the psychiatric context, the, uh, the directives are quite, um, quite regulated in the sense that there is a specific format, it's just a very basic format, but still there's a de definite reform that's given and um, there's a review board that is constituted. Um, even uh, there's a committee constituted for the determination of capacity and so on. Um, but it's a very different picture when it comes to the end of life advanced directives, uh, which is visible in the guidelines uh, of the common cause decision. Um, so there are some common features which have not changed um, as recently as in February, but so let's go through the common features first, which is that it's uh, executed by an adult of sound and healthy mind, which is determined by a position to communicate, relate and comprehend the consequences and the purpose of executing uh, the document. Um, there's also a voluntariness requirement without coercion and undue influence. Uh, there's a characteristic of informed consent. Again, uh, necessarily in writing, and clearly stating um, when it might be applicable and so on. Um, but also um, there's, a, um, there's a reference to dignity. So that's also quite interesting that uh, it's been related to human dignity and um, 
essentially regarding um, unnecessary pain, anguish, and suffering. Uh, but also, interestingly enough, the revocation of the advanced directive in the Indian context have uh, the same format as the preparation itself. Um, right, but anyway, because the guidelines, the, what I explained so far, it's not a complicated guideline. I'll get to that now. So the complicated part uh, was challenged as recently as in um, February 2023 uh, by the Indian Society uh, for Critical Care Medicine, which has been actually quite proactive in uh, legalizing advanced directives in India. Uh, the Supreme Court said, wait a minute, we actually just made a decision of hundreds of pages. And now you come back to us right away saying that the guidelines are not okay. But uh, interestingly, the government agreed with um, the, the society and said that actually, yes, there is a problem. Um, so the respondent was sympathetic to changing the guidelines. Uh, so there's a comparison between the old and the new guidelines. Um, the old guidelines specified that the document has to be countersigned by the judicial magistrate of first class. Um, it's, well, it's, it's a government authority, so to say, but just to put things in perspective, for example, in the city of Pune, in a population of 6 million people, uh, there are 19 judicial magistrate of first class. So you imagine that if, if you want to kind of really implement this, what that, that, what that requires. Um, so now in the new guidelines, the, the Supreme Court said, well, actually, let's decentralize this and um, even attestation by a notaries or a gazetted officer is, is acceptable. Um, earlier, the judicial magistrate first class was supposed to maintain the record both in paper and digital format, uh, but now it is so decentralized that um, the records are not to be maintained by the notary, but uh, the obligation is on the, on the, on the executor to kind of um, uh, maintain the record, not only that, to specify a guardian or close relative and uh, pass on the copy to them as well. Um, Earlier, the obligation was also on the judicial magistrate first class. Was, anyway, um, right. In terms of when the advanced directives become operational, um, interestingly enough, in the old guidelines, there was no mention of capacity. Uh, so as long as someone was in a prolonged medical treatment with no hope of recovery, the advanced directives already uh, were triggered, so to say. But now um, there's a clarification that the directives are only operational when the capacity has been lost. Um, or an above being terminally ill. Um, right. Um, the, in all guidelines, the hospital was to set up the primary ward with, um, when, it, when the directors become operational, the primary ward was to be set up with three experts from um, a list of fields with at least 20 years of um, medical uh, professional experience and uh, overall standing. Now they kind of reduce that requirement to um, to uh, five years of uh, medical professional experience. And a timeline is put that the opinion of the primary board has to be um, given in 48 hours. Um, the earlier guidelines sort of required um, information to be given to the jurisdiction, jurisdictional collector and our chief medical officer was supposed to kind of be present and um, uh, again, uh, be a decision maker in the secondary board, um, but in the new guidelines, the chief medical officer is to, uh, is to nominate another person to, um, uh, to give a secondary opinion. Uh, but again, they've kept the same um, category of people required for um, uh, making the decision about whether the advanced directive is applicable or not. Again, five years of experience um, as compared to the earlier 20 years of uh, expertise and overall standing and so on. Um, right. Again, um, in the earlier as well as in the newer guidelines, um, there's a capacity ascertainment uh, required at, at the stage where the secondary board is also making a decision. Um, and now only one can understand because there was no capacity requirement when the directive became applicable in the, in the newer guidelines too. Even if the directive is applicable when the capacity has been lost, there's once again a capacity evaluation. Um, so one wonders if there is an inconsistency, which is, or is it intentional, um, just to kind of make sure that the person is okay with the directive being implemented. Um, so one wonders, and um, in case both the boards have agreed that the directive is to be applicable, uh, then finally the decision has to be communicated to, once again, the judicial magistrate first class. Um, right. Um, Again, uh, I mentioned that re revocation is the same procedure as making of the advanced directive, but the guidelines clearly say that the decision can be revoked any time before um, the, the uh, uh, 
there's any time before the implementation of it. Uh, and one wonders if there's an inconsistency because there's surely if one person becomes incapacitated to make a decision, only then it's applicable, but then there's again the capacity evaluation and it can be revoked at any time. So one wonders um, whether that is there is a, a fragment of inconsistency, inconsistency therein. Um, but in case um, the secondary board refuses to um, withdraw the treatment, follow the directive, then um, the nominees or the treating doctor or even the hospital staff can approach the high court to, um, to challenge this decision of the secondary board. Um, but interestingly enough, while the Supreme Court has changed its guidelines, nothing has been changed about the role of the judiciary. So the same procedure applies in case the high court is approached. Um, the high court will set up a board with experts with 20 years of experience and overall standing. Um, and again, make a decision in the best interest of the person. Um, there's an addition, I mean, it's actually not an addition, but addendum, that in case there is no advance directive, once again, um, family members and um, are, are to be consulted to kind of uh, decide whether um, the primary board should make a decision to withdraw life support treatments. Um, right, one wonders, have the new guidelines solved the problems? Well, it is still a bureaucratic procedure. There are still uh, two boards to be set up. There are still government uh, agencies to be involved. Um, one wonders if there is an even lesser role of the family, given that instead of the family at large, only the nominated representatives are to be informed, are to be consulted. Um, the devil is, of course, is in the details. And um, again, this is just the Supreme Court coming up with guidelines, and it's not a law, uh, not an act of the parliament. So perhaps. That changes things. Um, interestingly enough, the years of seniority requirement has been reduced. So the wise old men um, making decision is, uh, is changed. And um, the high courts are still retaining their authority. So uh, judiciary still reigns supreme. Um, of course, in the chapter, we talk about the role of family religions. I won't go too much into that. Maybe we can um, go into that at the discussion stage. But um, Right, one wonders, I mean, the trend, and we've been arguing in the chapter that the trend has been to save the patient from their families, um, save by the judiciary or by the, by the doctors themselves. Um, but again, um, in the Supreme Court of India, recently the discussion is around the legalization of same-sex marriages. And given that India has uh, a plurality of religions and the private uh, law matters are determined by the codified religious laws, that might be a huge change that's coming up. Um, but thank you. This the short story. So this, thank you. Thank you. That was great. So we're zooming quickly from India to Malaysia, and we welcome Karen Cole from the University of Malaya. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. And and before I, I get into to the chapter, I just realized that um, this um, I, I missed two names. So. Um, I would like to thank my, my co-authors. Um, Thomas Tan was an excellent student, Ari, from the University of Malaya, who I think if you, as, as many of you, I think are legal academics when you are, I, I'm, I'm pretty short too, so I'm going to move to the end. I can't see over the thing. Um, that when you're actually trying to um, understand something that is, is either very under-regulated or semi-regulated, um, it's quite tough to find what's not there and to try and figure out what is there and how practice is moving. So uh, Thomas was quite heroic in, in plowing through much stuff and, and having some lively discussions. I would also like to particularly thank Jenny Ka Yen Yao from Hong Kong University, who really helped to bring this chapter into conclusion. Without Jenny, this chapter would um, not be part of the book. So I really want to just um, register my thanks to her for, for a lot of her work. And finally, see, I'm terrible. I, I left two of them out. It was really a, a mistake. Is um, Dr. Richard Boon Leong Lim. Richard is a palliative care doctor in, in Malaysia. He's actually the head of palliative care services. And I was quite concerned that, again, because as you will notice, some of the, the reflections that we made were, were based on um, what wasn't there, that I didn't want to misrepresent the situation in Malaysia. And I knew that Richard really had a good handle on, on what is actually happening in Malaysia. Um, and hopefully um, I'll, I'll be able to present this to you in a coherent manner. So um, in terms of a legal framework, there is no specific legal regulation in Malaysia that actually uh, manages or, or deals with um, advanced directives. 
But there is, um, I think, an appetite for this because we have the National Palliative Care Policy and Strategy Plan 2019 to 2030 that Richard was actually instrumental in writing. And that really sets out time and time again within the document this need to, um, to have decisions that are made that reflect the interests of the patient, that the patient's interests are well um, reflected in, in, in decision making. It talks about, it doesn't specifically talk about aid. Uh, advanced directives, but it does talk about the importance of advanced care plans and training doctors um, to think about advanced care plans and to really bring in the, the wishes and, and interests of the patient. So, um, so this is something that the government is thinking about, and at least the, the palliative care services in, in Malaysia is pushing quite strongly. So in the absence of legal regulation, the next thing is lawyers, we think about, well, how are decisions made at the end of life for people who no longer have the capacity to make these decisions? And again, not terribly well in Malaysia at the moment. There is no specific act dealing with issues of capacity, unlike Singapore and the UK. Um, we only have the Mental Health Act, which really manages... Um, people who are suffering from mental disorders and is primarily concerned with the incarceration and compulsory treatment of people with mental disorders. So it's really not the right, um, you know, engine or, or, or document that you want to take on capacity issues. Although capacity is covered there, it's, it's a functional test. Um, there is a provision for surrogate decision making. Um, but surrogates are prescribed by the Act. There's a list of people who can be surrogates. Um, individuals cannot choose who their surrogates are. So there's no notion of an enduring power of attorney or lasting power of attorney or a health um, proxy decision maker within the Mental Health Act. So legally in Malaysia, there isn't this recognition. Um, and even under um, Section 77, there are limited conditions and situations where surrogate decision making is permitted. And again, there's no specific criteria. There's no onus on, on a surrogate decision maker making decisions in the best interests of the patient. So really, it's a very broad discretion. Um, and therefore, in many situations, we would fall back, I would suggest, on the common law position that in the absence of an adult surrogate, the duty remains on the doctor to act in the best interests of the patient. So really, it remains quite a paternalistic position at law. However, there is um, professional guidance, and I think that really reflects what is happening on the ground. Um, specifically, I would draw your attention to the first two. The Malaysian Medical Council, which is the regulatory body of, the, of doctors in, in Malaysia, it registers and it has powers to discipline doctors in its code of professional conduct um, and guidelines and consent for treatment of patients, specifically mentions advanced directives. It says that doctors should... Um, um, defer to the wishes of patients if advanced directives are provided to them. They don't have to, but they should. Um, it, re it, it reminds doctors that they should be um, clearly written, they should be articulated clearly, they should address the specific situation, and they should be voluntarily made. But again, there is no legal requirement, there are no specific um, requirements. It suggests it, it, that um, doctors should consult legal advice if they're unsure, which is a bit weird because there is no legal requirement or no legal provision. So I'm not quite sure what a lawyer would do if a doctor uh, presented a lawyer with an advanced directive. Um, and it does say that in emergency situations, they can disregard an advanced directives and do what is in the best interest of the patient. But nevertheless, I think the recognition by the Malaysian Medical Council on an ethical basis that it is good practice to defer to these wishes is significant. Um, similarly, the Ministry of Health, um, one of its guidelines for resuscitation training in Malaysia, um, actually speaks of advanced directives and noting that in, in terms of um, do not resuscitate orders, if there is an advanced directive written by the patient, it should be included in the medical records. So it doesn't talk about the legality of which, but it recognizes that these things may exist and they should be incorporated into the medical records. So quite a, a mixed picture. Um, so in the absence of, of, of strict rules, um, one of the things that we really looked to were, was a, a number of articles um, where empirical um, evidence was obtained by way of interviews about um, the feelings of patients and, and, and doctors. Um, certainly family members play a pivotal role, both in terms of um, the views of the patients. They wanted their families to play a pivotal role. So I think there really is an appetite um, for inclusionary decision making. Um, and physicians also play an important advisory role. Um, in, in many of these studies, um, 
potential patients and, and people who would use these advanced directives said that they wanted their physicians to initiate the conversations. They wanted their physicians to remain um, important um, advisors during the process. And physicians, interestingly, raised concerns about the need for advanced directives and ACPs, um, citing that they, they did face situations where there were family disputes, where, where they had different members of the family who wanted different things. They weren't clear about what the patient wanted, um, and that the lack of legal clarity troubled physicians. So there is, I think, a push from at least the medical fraternity. Um, in the context of Islam, so Malaysia is quite interesting. We have a... Um, we are a Muslim majority country and we have a, almost a hybrid legal system where we have Islamic laws as well as secular laws. Um, healthcare issues are primarily uh, matters covered by secular laws, but over the years, we've really had quite a contestation in these spaces where the Sharia and the, the Islamic authorities have been increasingly um, making inroads into um, enacting laws that, that appear to go beyond what um, is, is traditionally regarded as either family law or, or matters relating to, to Islam, which again can be interpreted very broadly. Um, so that's of interest to us because it really impacts on, on the development of policy and law and even the way the courts may be willing or unwilling to take on a, a particular um, issue. Um, there is this divide between public interest versus private interest. So the notion of autonomy um, is, is recognized, but it isn't something that is given primacy that there is this notion that there is also a, a public interest primarily um, to be determined by expert um, opinion and in, in many instances to, to be referred to the doctor. So again, paternalism is also something that, that comes up quite strongly in the, in the context of Islam. And that there's a very low understanding of, of ACPs and ADs in the public. They don't know about it. But interestingly enough, in quite a number of these studies, when the researchers actually spoke to members of the public, quite a, a number of them, or a high percentage, um, evidenced an interest in, in having ADs. They just never heard of it, uh, provided that, that physicians and, and family members continue to play an important role. So really, what are the challenges in Malaysia? I think the lack of legal regulations um, it, it is a big challenge. Um, we need clear guidance on, on ADs to give doctors the assurance, the, 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 the confidence that they can rely on, on these documents and what these documents actually should or shouldn't contain. Um, the impact of, of religion, I think, is, is a challenge. And I think that is, is very closely enmeshed with political realities. And that's a whole other discussion we, we can have maybe at a later date. In Malaysia, there's, there's a real contestation of the political space between um, conservative and liberal Islam. And what happens in that space, I think, will largely determine uh, what happens in the legal space and even what happens in, in the courts. And I think that's very interesting um, in, in Malaysia. Professional guidelines at present are more concerned with the form of the AD that has to be cleared, you know, almost to avoid legal liability. And I think the challenge is, is really that these guidelines are infused with the principles of values that should govern ADs much more than just these uh, very procedural matters. The training of physicians when to have these conversations and, and the communication skills that are needed. I've increasingly had discussions with intensivists and palliative care doctors, and this is one of the big challenges um, they are facing. And, and I think the need to have greater and, and public consultation as well as education, because clearly the public is interested, there is an appetite, um, but we're not really doing a good job at present in, in engaging with the public. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Really good presentation about what's going on in Malaysia. And finally, to bring our presentation uh, period of the meeting to a close, Dr. Mante Yong from the University of Macau is going to speak to what's going on in Macau. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, Thank you for the invitation, especially for uh, Lacey and Michael. I'm really happy to be here with you. And my topic is about the ADs in Macau. Uh, actually, this chapter was written not only by me, but also by Vera Lucia Raposo, my master and PhD uh, supervisor. So about the ADs in Macau, this is the content. I, I will not uh, talk too much because I only have 10 minutes, okay? Uh, I will give you some introduction about Macau. Uh, maybe you know where is Macau, especially the local ones. Uh, we apply the principle one country, two systems. In Macau, like the, uh, in Hong Kong, we apply the same principle. So Macau, like in Hong Kong, we have uh, 
the own executive, legislative, and judicial powers. And we have legal theories and practices inspired by the Portuguese legal tradition. So this is the reason why we apply, we can apply the same uh, Portuguese informed consent theory uh, in Macau. So this is the reason why the court in Macau always applies the, uh, the doctrine and the case law in Portugal. So we cite the case law in Portugal. Um, in Portugal, uh, since 2012, uh, ADs have been legally recognized, but in Macau, we do not uh, uh, follow this step. And ADs, ADs, this is the conclusion I want to emphasize here. ADs in Macau are not subject to specific legislation in Macau. So we do not have any regulation in Macau about AD issues. So here, I just want to say that even though we do not have any regulation about the AB, issue, uh, we can apply AB according to the criminal code, especially the article 150, number one. So I will read here, uh, the people mentioned in the article uh, 144, especially the doctor or other legally authorized person, that in view of the purpose, for example, the intention to prevent illness, diagnose, diffuse or alleviate illness, suffering, etc., etc., perform effective in intervention or treatment without the patient's consent shall be punished with imprisonment up to three years or a fine. So it is a crime if we do not obtain informed consent from the uh, patient. But the problem is that until now we do not, we cannot see any case case law, especially in the court, uh, about uh, using this yeah, legal norm, legal disposition, uh, disposition against doctors. So uh, this is the reason uh, here I want to emphasize, because we have two more exceptions to apply the number one of the article of the article uh, 150. Uh, number, the first situation is about urgent situation. Uh, so. The, uh, in urgent situation, we do not apply the, the informed consent. It is a general principle. And another situation is where, uh, is uh, uh, a little complicated. It, uh, the consent has been given for a certain uh, intervention or treatment, but a different one has been carried out uh, because it has been imposed by the state of knowledge and experience in medicine as a means of avoiding danger to life, body, or health. So to apply this number two, we still have one more condition. No circumstances exist to safely conclude that consent would be refused. This part, this yellow part, is what we call uh, presumed consent. So uh, to apply, to apply uh, this part, yellow part, uh, I can say it is very uh, difficult to apply in Macau, okay? Uh, the AD situation is included in the yellow part here. Uh, sure, we have more circumstances. For, for example, the conversation of the daughter with the patient's uh, family members, relatives, or friends. So in case of doubt or, or um, hesitation regarding the prison, with presumed consent, the doctor must save the life, uh, do what she, uh, he or she should do uh, according to the indubio pro hell uh, pro vida principle. So um, this is the yellow part. The yellow part is the legal base for applying applying ADs in Macau. But I need to say it is not easy to apply ADs in Macau uh, because. Uh, according to this legal norm, doctors must take into account, uh, take into consideration patients' ADs. But taking into consideration does not mean ADs are binding, are binding for the doctors. So uh, uh, the doctors only the doctors only violate this norm, especially the uh, yellow part, uh, when the doctors do not read AD documents. So. If the doctor reads the AD documents, but against the wishes by saying that, for example, the wishes are not true or current 
okay, we do not uh, have the applicability of ADs uh, in this case. So in conclusion, there is no legal status of ADs in Macau. We do not have any regulation in Macau uh, about AD issues. ADs are applicable in Macau, but it is not easy to apply AD in Macau. Here, yeah, I just want to show you two special situations for telling you that how doctors and family members can affect applicability of ADs in Macau. For example, the patient has a document, AD document, and say, I don't want any medical intervention when I, in, uh, I am in certain situation. In this situation, the doctor may be have. Uh, may have personal interpretation interpretation uh, about, for example, the reasons in AD are not true or current. So in this situation, we can uh, see the first situation about the uh, affecting the applicability of ADs in Macau. So it depends on the judgment, the personal judgment of doctors. So the second situation is related to family members. For example, uh, the patient is my father, my mother, I don't want him or she to die. So I tell something to the doctor to affect the in, uh, interpretation of the doctors. So in this case, uh, doctor's interpretation can be affected by family members. So in conclusion, uh, we have uh, also no applicability of ADs in this situation. So two situations very easy to affect the applicability of ADs in Macau. And so it is not easy to apply ADs in Macau. So it is a problem that the government should resolve very quickly. Uh, about the attitudes of the Macau government, I only can say uh, in 2019, uh, the Macau government only had one meeting about the AD issues, especially the questions and future policy uh, guidelines for ADs. And in that uh, meeting, they agreed to legitimize ADs. But we have not seen any further step about AD issues. This is very upset for me because I promoted this uh, issue in Macau many times, especially writing papers. My thesis is about ADs also. <laughs> so about the possible features of a future legislation for Macau, I think Macau in the future uh, may maybe Macau need to learn a lot from Hong Kong experience because Hong Kong, according to the meeting of yesterday, 90% uh, or 95% finalized of the uh, bill. I don't know, uh, maybe in the recent future, we can see the, the law in Hong Kong, but very slow in Macau. Uh, so I can see maybe a Macau government should learn much more about the uh, Hong Kong or Singapore, Malaysia, Thai, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what should uh, what are the, the features that we need to have in the legislation? For example, we need to resolve a problem. Uh, if the ADs are binding or indicative, this is the first question that we need to resolve. And the re requirements, especially the formalities and the forms of AD, very time of ADs, uh, five years, three years, or no need to determine the time for ADs issues. And also the way to easy uh, to easily revoke ADs. So I here I just want to give one more uh, uh, point, uh, emphasize one more point. In my opinion, uh, in Macau we should have one public entity from the government uh, uh, about the AD issues, and we should create one platform, one platform with two connections. Uh, one connection to the doctors, you know, uh, the doc I know the doctors are very busy in every moment, uh, especially in urgent cases, so they do not have the time to check if the patient has uh, AD documents or if the AD document is, is valid or not. So the duty to check uh, uh, these issues should be from the government, not the doctors. So 
The governor should create one platform with a connection to dog test, especially to the dog test PC. So the doctor uh, open the computer and check, okay, this patient has uh, has AD documents. Okay, this patient has no AD document and go ahead to do what uh, the doctor need to do. Okay, and another connection to the public, especially for uh, education, promotion of AD issues. If I'm the person who wants to make an AD, I want to go to the this public entity to know, okay, how to make an AD formally. And this public entity will teach me in a legal way. So this is the, the, the best way uh, we can do in Macau or in Hong Kong. I don't know, maybe this is useful. So thank you for, for, for listening to my presentation. Um, so that concludes our um, series of book launch uh, events. I do hope um, that you get to have a chance to look at the book, which is, um, as many of us have mentioned, open access. Um, I'd just like to um, um, spend uh, end this by thanking a few people. So obviously, I want to thank all of our contributors, uh, my co-editor, Mikey, um, and of course, to the Wayne Foundation for their generous donation, which supported this open access um, and, and being able to access everyone, or people being able to access this book is very important to us. Um, and of course, um, we, we couldn't do this without the support from CML, the HKAM, and in particular, our excellent admin team and student helpers. Um, and of course, thank you to you all for coming. Uh, we know it's tough to come out you know, at night uh, on a weekday, but we really uh, treasure the opportunity to talk to you guys in person and to have these conversations in person. So thank you very much for coming, and we hope you enjoyed our event. Thank you.